Okay, I got a question. Are cruise line private islands like Royal Caribbean's Perfect Day at Coco Cay, are they cheapening the cruise experience? Um, it, it's something I've been thinking about for a while and tracking along with, and well, excitingly, I got to sit down and talk to a Royal Caribbean expert about a lot of topics, but I wanna share this one with you here. Uh, let's talk specifically about the private island experience and really what, what the impact is on the broader cruise industry. You might recognize the guy, Matt from Royal Caribbean blog, uh, talking about private islands. <music> There's one other thing when I'm thinking about what feels divergent in cruising right now. It seems like we're seeing an increased play uh, on the private island. And so you've got more years cruising than I do. Of course, when uh, Coco Key became what it is and it really became the dominant private island, that became, I feel like, the standard for others to look at. But it certainly wasn't the first private island. Uh, can you chart, like at least in your cruise experience, what the what the role how how predominant private islands were in the cruise experience for the last ten years or something? Yeah, I mean, private islands used to be part of the game plan, like they were like a, a place you could go to, and they've been largely you know very very successful. Um, but they were always more just glorified private beaches, right? Your ship would pull in, you go to the beach, have a barbecue, lunch, and kind of hang out there for the day, and it was nice. And I think I don't know this for a fact, but my opinion on this is that I think. Um, and you've certainly seen this, Tony, where there are certain ports of call that cruise ships go to that consistently get really negative reviews. Passengers come back, so we had a great time on the cruise, but man, we had such a not great time over in, you know, uh, you know, Nassau, Falmouth, whatever the place may be, right? And cruise lines thrive on guest satisfaction. That's what gets them business. And so I think they saw an opportunity to do, to invest in their own product, create a an area they can control, their private island, but really provide something that really draws people in, that really attracts them over to that. And the the investment went from beyond like, hey, let's get a stretch of beach somewhere and call it our own private beach. Let's now offer more in terms of attractions, entertainment, food, and things to do than we've ever offered, similar to how that cruise ships have evolved from that. Because cruise ships used to be just basically floating hotels that with a pool that you know went around, and now they have a lot more of their destinations in and of themselves. What if we go to this? This provides a place that uh, uh, passengers can go to that they're going to love from a guest satisfaction standpoint, and you know the cruise line is making all the money from start to finish because every single dollar spent on that island is goes right back to them, right? Because it's their it's their private venue. There's no outside third party excursions there. So it, that seemed to have, that was a big bet um, when Royal Caribbean wanted to reinvest in Coco Key and redevelop it. And I think the rest of the industry really jumped on that trend. And now you're seeing so many more lines try to embrace that strategy because it's a money maker and it's a it's a smile maker it makes it makes it makes us happy yeah so the the interesting thing is um and this is completely philosophical and it doesn't really have any bearing in anything i don't think but i think there was always kind of like some higher idea that uh cruising is a way to open up travel to people that don't traditionally travel uh, you know it feels a little bit like if the focus is to put people on a cruise ship in florida and then take them to an island that is completely controlled by the cruise line and then take them back to florida that doesn't really even seem like international travel at all anymore, but I don't think anybody cares, so I don't know why I'm worried about it. So I guess the broad question, <laughs> is cruising real travel, or you know, is this a vacation option that is kind of the best of both worlds, where you can go on a luxury cruise ship with all these amenities and go to a completely you know uh, contained place and not have to worry about international travel? Do, do you, for you and your family, Family, do you have any like, oh, I want to experience the cultural aspects of cruising or does it matter? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, outside of the, the weekend cruise, the three and four nighters that only go to the Bahamas, like that, those were never cultural immersions to begin with anyway. So we'll just, we'll just side uh, step those for a second. I think in general, there is some, I think most people like that idea. And to be fair, if you're going on a longer cruise in three or four nights, you're going somewhere other than their private island. Um, I, I think at the end of the day, obviously, why do you go on a cruise? Because you want to have a good time. It's a vacation, right? In the same way that if you go to New York City, 
Tony, some people eat at Sabaro, and they go to um, they eat at um, you know the the, the kitschy uh, TGI Fridays and places like that. Like, what are you doing? You're going to New York City, and that's where you're eating. Like, there are, and I say some people, I mean millions of people do that, right? This isn't like yeah. you know four or five. Um, that doesn't mean it's a bad vacation. It's what they want to do. It's what they enjoy. And I think there's nothing wrong with that. Um, not every trip needs to be this like you know global trek in which you're in like this undeveloped area uh, you know discovering a new tribe or 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 i don't know embracing a brand new culture to you i think you can get degrees of that by visiting these places and i think that cruising brings you to some of the other fo- the other places in the world that uh, excuse me offer something that are more than you know just sitting by the beach but for a lot of people especially in the caribbean Sitting by the beach is like the number one reason people go on a cruise. They enjoy that experience there. And we shouldn't shame that. I mean, it's still somewhere different. They're still getting out there. They're probably getting a passport. And if you buy a passport, that's going to open up a whole world of travel for you as an investment in your travel career. Um, it's really cruising is a gateway drug for, for travel in general. And, and if you're, you know, it doesn't, just because you're at Coco Key doesn't mean that you're not necessarily going to want more of it and want to experience more of it. And I think a lot of cruisers start out with Caribbean cruises and end up like, well, I'd really like to go to Europe because I saw Tony post a video that he was out there and he went on Spectrum of the season. Matt didn't go there, so I want to check that out myself. Like that, it, it, it breeds the, the interest more than, than anything. So I'm going to lose points because when I went to Japan, I did eat at a McDonald's when I was on Spectrum. <laughs> Steve. But I also ate at a authentic sushi place, too. But I wanted to know what McDonald's in, in Japan was sure. like. Uh, but what you just described was exactly my circumstance. Uh, we just cruised to the Caribbean a few times, and I went, wow, this is the cruising makes it really viable. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, I'll go to China. That was like my big leap. I'd never been off the continent before, and the very first trip I took, I, I went to China and got on yeah. a ship and went to Japan. So uh, for me, cruising was that gateway, and I think maybe that's why I'm protective of it. Like I said, it's really a throwaway idea that, you know, everybody cruises for their own reason, that kind of thing. Thing. But but talking about the special destinations, you know, beyond just sitting on a beach somewhere, uh, what are some of your favorite places that you visited beyond the beach, and do you have any places that you aspire to go to? Oh, certainly. Uh, I mean, Europe was. I did my first European cruise last year, and that was eye opening on many levels, and I love that. Um, and we're doing that uh, in 2025 with the family, so that'll be great. But Alaska's always been the place, Tony, where I can go there, like, every time. I mean, it's like you think, like, oh, see the glaciers, all right, that's, like, you know, done, that's it. But, man, I love Alaska. Um, it's not also because it's a great escape from Florida summer, but I, I really enjoy the, the, the majesty of it, the beauty of the area. It is a phenomenal place to go to, and if I could, uh, I would love to go there every year. But the aspirational place, I mean, more of Europe. I've only done one European cruise. I only want to do that. And then, I mean, I would like to do, obviously, an, an Australia and an Asian cruise, especially Asia, going to Japan. That looks amazing. I've seen what you've done. I've seen what Sherry from Cruise Tips TV has done over there. And that looks absolutely amazing. I have a deep flying phobia. Uh, I, I'm mm. going to get over it at some point, but um, I would love to do that because I think that would be a, um, a just an incredible experience. Because if I liked Alaska, but more Europe, I think I'm going to love those places as well. Well, there you go. And I'll throw the question over to you. Uh, private islands, are they good for cruising? Are they bad for cruising? Do they cheapen the cruise experience, the travel experience? What say ye? Leave a comment below. And look, this is just part of a larger conversation I had with Matt from Royal Caribbean blog. We go deep on the Icon. We talk a good half an hour about the world's largest cruise ship, his experiences on the Icon of the Seas. Plus, if you're curious as to how Matt got into cruising, make sure you go check out the La Lida Loca Cruise Podcast. It's episode 36. You can get that wherever you listen to podcasts, or you can see the video of it on the La Lida Loca Cruise Podcast channel. I will leave a link to that in the description below. Big thanks to Matt for spending time with us. Make sure you go check out his YouTube channel, Royal Caribbean Blog. Uh, Yeah, big thanks for watching this episode today. Do me a solid, hit that like button on the way out. This is Tony for La Lido Loca, and until the next time, we'll see you on the Lido. Bye.